Hi. I heard you mention. Hey, I heard you mention general welfare. Oh yes, yes, general welfare. What do you know about general welfare? Well, that preamble um, happened to be the Confederacy getting together in a perpetual union with itself and maintaining corporate welfare outside of the welfare of human beings with Article 12 of the Articles of Confederation. And as we all know, um, the Articles of Confederation that came in to form a more perfect perpe perpetual union, which means eternal, with each other as a confederacy, described and defined in Black's Law Dictionary as a criminal enterprise. And by the time they got to the 12th article, they had pledged and charged human beings to maintain corporate welfare as per the first and second welfare theorem. First and second welfare theorem. I mean, which theorem is that? Where is that written at all? Well, you can find that as it's described as Pareto's rule or Pareto optimal. Um, uh, anybody can can search out the first and second welfare theorems and, and read about uh, fiscal optimality, Pareto's rule, um, eighty twenty. Uh, you know where you have. The premise is, is that if you give somebody 20% of something, they're going to fight like heck to get the other 80% of it. And in that, they're going to produce effectively. Huh. So corporate welfare. Absolutely. Every time that you see Donald Trump or another corporation go bankrupt, they lay it on the core level, which is the federal state, and that's dispersed across all of every human's back to maintain that corporation, make sure that it never goes homeless or hungry. <laughs> yeah, they'll uh, worry, uh, not too much worry about being cold or anything because they're basically a fiction, aren't they? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, for the listeners out there, uh, this is not a setup, but yes, it is. This is someone I'm associated with. Uh, I had asked uh, her to come on tonight, and we're going to have a little discussion about this because she's very knowledgeable uh, in many areas regarding uh, what we discuss here. And I've made, made mention of a few things throughout the past few months on it. And do you mind me giving your website? No, not at all. Uh, why don't you do it? Well, you can find me at chooseyourside.org. And we just now got the other site up uh, called Tammy, T-A-M-I, Pepperman.org as well. And in that we teach the public law and where humanity should be in all of this. Corporations should not be, of course, on welfare. Um, Congress had maintained a contract with the Treasury uh, which is the House of Lords holding that treasury to maintain human beings on general welfare for posterity, forever. And uh, they did not. They abrogated that contract and went to the side and started embezzling from the House of Lords. And nice. at this point in time, it's gotten so far out, we're looking at Nazi Germany again uh, with the culling of the overhead which is the same same dynamic as Nazi Germany. Uh, the Bayer Corporation came in in 1928 into the world courts, which of course is maintained by Congress. And at that time they asked to indemnify Poland in order to offset its overhead. And, and at that time that's why uh, Polish citizens were, were cold, uh, Polish administration, uh, law enforcement psychologists, psychiatrists, teachers, doctors, uh, they were all called to pave the way for um, the perfect union there that uh, didn't like the overhead when it got too great. Right. Yeah, and there's a case that uh, that it pertains to, I think it's uh, Charzo, is that how it's pronounced? Right, the company at Charzo, and you can find that at the World Courts uh, site um, as well to see how, how Nazi Germany was set up. And then on the other side, then you can see the play, the media manipulation, which of course, as everybody who listens to us knows, the BBG, or the Broadcasting Board of Governors, has full-on international control of all civil media. Yeah. So, 
yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of, uh, as they say, history repeats itself. Absolutely. Uh, what I really liked about your site, uh, when I first came across it, I was, I'm in possession of a document known as the uh, uh, Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation. Right. Not only am I in uh, possession of it, but I had a, uh, an ancestor uh, who participated uh, in doing many of the land surveys here in Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Right. And when I heard you speak about it, that's when I uh, reached out and contacted you about it. Right. And uh, it's been nothing but a journey since that since that that moment for me myself personally. Right. And and that's uh, something that you know that's the most profound aspect out of everything. I mean, we can take out part their their original charters. Yes, they were human trafficking. They were garnering human beings by letters patent, uh, by description of the last name. But in the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation that ended up posting human beings to discharge congressional bankruptcy. And in doing so, of course, the back end of that is uh, um, 18 U.S.C. 1342, which says you're being held as a criminal if you are claiming that last name while you're checking the mail. Yes, I have that uh, definition here in my little... What, what, what I'd like to call uh, my cheat cards here, because I don't have it totally memorized. But it's really something on there. There's some, uh, let, me, let me read it, uh, Tammy, and then uh, you can expound on, uh, what is it? I think it's the proper name. Right. And this is what it says. This is Title 18, USC 1342. Whoever, for the purpose of conducting, promoting, or carrying on by means of the Postal Service, any scheme or device mentioned in Section 1341 of this title, or any other unlawful business uses or assumes or requests to be addressed by any fictitious, false, or assumed title, name or address, or name other than his own proper name, or takes and or receives from any post office or authorized depository of mail matter any letter, postal card, package, or other mail matter addressed to any such fictions, false or assumed title, name, or address, or name other than his own proper name, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than five years, or both. Right. Which is horrifying. Now, what, what is it about the proper name? Well, and it says specifically that you're to use the proper name. And in Black's Law Dictionary, first edition, 1891, uh, we go to the word cognomen. In Roman law, a man's family name. The first name, praenomen, was the proper name of the individual. The second name, nomen, indicated the gens or tribe to which he belonged. While the third, which is cognomen, denoted his family, which indicates that you're a new species of human being. And, and to describe this, I'll bring up my maiden name, for example. My maiden right. name is Eric's son. That described me as somebody's child. Well, there's other descriptions that go even more uh, horrifyingly into depth, such as Smith, indicating you're a blacksmith or a silversmith. That means that they found you by letters patent and described you. And that was the foundation of all of their original charters. Congress has always been your transgressor. Um, they had allotted to each other the ability to claim you as lost souls. And this goes back into the old mythology of the River Styx and, and everything else. Because when you get into... Um, that old mythology of the river, the river sticks and everybody's floating on this river and they're without their soul They're just lost souls. They provide Foundling hospitals on the edge of that river for by which to find you and a bank is one of those and As everybody who listens to us knows a bank is a court. That's what the court is. It's a bank It's a foundling hospital as much as a hospital is according to the 1864 Geneva Convention wherein the Red Cross was set up to find you as well, lost souls on the River Styx. And at this point in time, they're practicing what is known as bottomry. 
bottom right bonds is when they find you the lost vessel, claim it as their own, diagnose it and start to repair it, take loans out on it, let it work for them for a while because nobody's coming in to claim their inheritance. Nobody's coming in to claim that they're the heir. Nobody's coming in to claim that they're the owner of the vessel. Everybody's asking others to represent them. Yes. Now, now the bottom re uh, bond that you speak about, that refers specifically to maritime law, doesn't it? Absolutely. You are a vessel, and, and when you go into the dynamics of the female, you've got the female holding the birth canal. You've got the Versailles treaties that says France owns all the water. So you have a child being birthed, or a vessel being birthed on somebody else's land. This is quite, uh, an, uh, I guess you want to call it a very, uh, compl not complicated, but uh, compact and like an octopus type thing where there's a web. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's really, truly amazing. And once again, you know, going back to your site, because uh, I have been studying it uh, for a while, all the different original charters, especially the one that goes back to Virginia. Right. I found quite interesting. Right. Uh, and I have read that one here on, you know, on the show a couple of weeks ago. Right. And when you go back to it, you know, that you've got all of these concepts. Washington himself, one of the founding fathers, foundling fathers, was actually, if you go back into the etymology, a, a concept. Washington means the estate of a man named Wassel. Well, what's a Wassel? It's a vassal. It's somebody who's pledging allegiance to another or paying homage to another landlord. Huh. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty... Uh, what I find most intriguing is the, uh, I guess, the use of language, right? Absolutely. Uh, because... Uh, English being the designed to be the uh, language of commerce for this particular this particular time in history. Absolutely, and and you know prior to that you had the language of contract, which is uh, Latin. Uh, right. Words and descriptions move you about as to your state of being, and and you know we're taught to be patriotic to these languages, and that's the first step in Babylonian theory, which if you uh, interpret it now, it's, it's asymmetrical warfare, it's fourth generation warfare, low intensity conflict, uh, psychological warfare employed upon us, when in reality, in our natural state of being, we do not speak to each other in such things. We don't have an imagination, we don't have use for imagination or imaginary words or speeches. Um, when you go all the way back, you find the great Reda, it's Redera, it's just a uh, a, a loud oration, and, and that's how it's always been. The House of Representatives maintaining the same marquee as the House of Geln or any of the other houses uh, doing the dog and pony show by which to trick and deceive. Yeah. Uh, what's another interesting aspect is the uh, thing known as the law merchant. Absolutely. Stemming, uh, you know, right now. Uh, the law merchant used to be called the law merchant, and then it was called the Negotiable Instrument Acts. Then after that, it was called UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, because when your rights are stolen by law or, or congressional action, you have a requirement then to buy them back by legal process, and that's when you, in fact, become the product. Human resources, correct? Absolutely, and it, and normally, it, for example, it's done by, by just separation. Gender, the word gender alone, the etymology maintains that you're a different genus or a different species of human. The minute you claim to be such as a female or a male, because your rights are then given to you after you purchase the first concept, female or male. I already know what I am. You already know what you are. Why is there somebody telling us these things, stealing our rights by legal action of Congress, and then selling them back to us by a court process. Now, uh, who is it that, uh, I've heard you mention the, uh, not the BBG, but Corporate Council. Absolutely. The Association of Corporate Council, Board of Directors, 
These are all the directors that are directing policy and telling people what to do. Such as uh, at the head of the show, you were talking about things that have happened with Katrina and there in New Orleans. Now, when you go back to these law enforcement officers being uh, nailed for shooting people on the bridges and everything else, you need to look for the directors. The directors are the attorneys. They're the fund managers on these accounts. And they're the ones cashing in while the police and law enforcement are being made the fall guy. Right. Now, now that, it, when you say that, that ties in with the insurance, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's all insurance. Um, you actually have three levels of government, which is broadcasting. You have the media first. Underneath the media is insurance. Underneath the insurance is the court and legal process. And they implicate that on a daily basis. Absolutely. Within fourth generation warfare, because everybody's unaware that it's not, uh, they believe that it's decentralized form of government, although it's the same perpetrators over and over again. It is Congress, it is the board of directors, and they're running everything. Everybody under that is usually, such as the CIA, is just a production company. The NSA is underneath the production company of the CIA. Um, everything is for the illusion and the benefit of citizenry wherein they consent. They continually consent to everything that's happening to them based on patriotism and heraldry, the action of heraldry. I see, yeah. And I've heard you mention, uh, well, the, beside the uh, National Security Act, then there was the formation of the actual, uh, you speak of the Central Intelligence Group which is then renamed into the Central Intelligence Agency. Absolutely, and, and prior to that, it was always something else. Shakespeare said way, way back when, all the world is a stage. It's yeah. always been the same actors. And that falls under the thing known as a marquee, huh? Absolutely, and, and a marquee, of course, is just a large tent. And, and if you can imagine, you know, the, the setup is, is always the same. It's always the same production. And you find that in a marquee, what do you have outside the marquee is a billboard. You have a billing board, which is the board of governors. They're the ones that are sending out bills and directing policy. And it's always been just the same act. And then when you go into the court process, in Black's Law, the court itself is, is called negotiorum gestio. It's a friendly form of negotiation, dancing around. Well, then when you get to the definition of what an attorney is, the attorney is called the negotiorum gestor. All he does is dances around providing a show. He's the same court gesture as it always was. The same one with the little pointy shoes and the little hat with the dingle balls on it. <laughs> the dingle balls, I like that. Yep. That's kind of funny. <laughs> the image is really something. You can look that up. Anybody's interested, you can find that. You can type that into a Google search. Gestor or negotiorum gestor, and you'll see uh, uh, what, what the picture actually looks like. I think in Britain there was a, uh, one of those, uh, William uh, <coughs> Biden, uh, not Biden, uh, something like that, I forget what his name was, but he was pretty well uh, renowned at, during that time. Right, the, the one who died and, and left the court mourning his loss, and, and Shakespeare did that again in... Uh, Hamlet, he was talking about the attorney in Hamlet during the cemetery scene, and, and they'd said, well, you know, how long does it take for decomposition? And he says, well, it depends on if you're rotten to begin with or not. You know, he was slamming attorneys. And um, that's one of my favorite parts of Hamlet. Well, that's pretty much like, you know, when money comes up missing, usually it's been stolen. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you, how much, uh, excuse me, does, does literature, you know, the uh, whether it's fiction or reality, play into all of this uh, uh, this scenario as far as putting together these? Uh, I call it a schematic. It plays every part because the first step in breaking human being is, of course, the psychological dynamic. When a psychopath comes into your community, say you're in a feral state, you're in your nature, a psychopath comes into the community, the first thing I have to do is traumatize you by which you will engage with them. 
at that point in time after the trauma, then they're implicating the psychological dynamic. They have to teach you a language. They have to teach you something to, to maintain you under their control. And that's where we come back to Babylon, Babylonian theory. Now, if you do that to the next group, your neighbors over there, teach them a different language, pit you against each other. Now they're generating revenue by watching you go at yourselves. That's civil warfare. And you can see that written in Exodus itself. Here comes a judge down the hill, and, and he's telling you, you all are killing each other and stealing each other's wives and asses. And in the next instant, you have them offering you protection for a tax, which is what Leviticus means. Leviticus means the action of taxation. Yes, levy. Yes. Yep, to levy. Yeah. yeah, and this is what, I've, I've, uh, years ago I read this thing. It's known as, uh, what is it, the... Uh, Solid weapons for quiet wars. Absolutely, and, and, and nobody realizes it. You know, you've got the silent weapon for quiet wars. I can bring that up and read you one of my favorite parts. Um, just one second. Uh, okay. Because they're, they're shooting situations at you, and, and that's what everybody needs to wrap their minds around because it's, it's so hard to conceive. And so I'll read um, from the descriptive, descriptive introduction of the silent weapon. Quote, everything that is expected from an ordinary weapon is expected from a silent weapon by its creators, but only in its own manner of functioning. It shoots situations instead of bullets, propelled by data processing instead of chemical reactions or explosions, originating from bits of data instead of grains of gunpowder from a computer instead of a gun, operated by a computer programmer instead of a marksman, under the orders of a banking magnet instead of a military general. It makes no obvious explosive noises, causes no obvious physical or mental injuries, and does not obviously interfere with anyone's daily social life. Yet it makes an unmistakable noise, causes unmistakable physical and mental damage, and unmistakably interferes with the daily social life i.e. unmistakable to the trained observer, one who knows what to look for. The public cannot comprehend this weapon and therefore cannot believe they are being attacked and subdued by a weapon. The public might instinctively feel that something is wrong, but that is because of the technical nature of the silent weapon. They cannot express their feeling in a rational way or handle the problem with intelligence. Therefore, they do not know how to cry for help and do not know how to associate with others to defend themselves against it. When a silent weapon is applied gradually, the public adjusts or adapts to its presence and learns to tolerate its encroachment on their lives until the pressure, psychological via economic, becomes too great and they crack up. Therefore, the silent weapon is a type of biological warfare. It attacks the vitality, options, and mobility of the individuals of a society by knowing, understanding, manipulating and attacking their sources of natural and social energy and their physical, mental and emotional strengths and weaknesses. Now say for example we take Katrina that looked uh, it appeared to be a, a natural disaster. Now if you go to the uh, grants.gov and you go ahead and look up cloud seeding programs and everything else in that order uh, in that area, you'll find that that was created for you. That's a situation being shot at you. The next situation would be you, you have a bankruptcy going on or you have a foreclosure against you or all of a sudden child protection comes to attack you or adult protection comes into your lives. These are situations putting you down upon your knees, telling you you're bad in some way, telling you that you can't support yourself, telling you to rely on the same predator who's causing these situations. That's quite an ingenious, uh, uh, blaming the victim type of scheme. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it happens day in and day out, especially with the use of the uh, education system. Absolutely, and that's what it was designed for. Education is not broken. When you go back to the foundation of education, and everybody can read that, um, in the treatise of education, treatise on education by Rousseau, it's otherwise known as Emile, E-M-I-L-E, and it will detail, in detail for anybody who wishes to read it, 
how you are broken and and it's basically how to break the human being for dummies you teach it to rely on something else you teach it all of these concepts you teach it the product what to be at any given moment in time and and that is part of um, you you go to the side as well because when they implicate these natural disasters against you or they implicate war against you or they implicate these low intensity conflict situations against you your automatic response is one to go to the church which is them and two to go to the government which is them now in 1974 Henry Kissinger came into the National Security Council with Memorandum 200 and said that depopulation should be the highest priority of all foreign policy. Foreign policy means communication in between two different states. Each county is a state. It's a foreign nation defined under 28 U.S.C. 97. Each state is a state. Each federal state is a state. So you have all of these things that are going on at any given moment in time against you, and you're not realizing the pressure. You're not realizing where the force is coming from. And in the end, you're relying on the same predator that's preying on you by patriotism. Yes, it's quite uh, confusing at the same time as frustrating. Absolutely. And most people, uh, due to, I guess, the, the nature of humanity in general, uh, I believe, you know, most of humanity is uh, pretty decent. Absolutely. There's only 3% of all, uh, quote, human-looking or human-appearing on this planet is only 3% is psychopathic. And that's throughout history. It's always been, you know, about the upper 3%, the upper 3%. Those are all psychopaths. Th the ability to view a human being as an object is a psychopathic trait. Human beings do not view each other as objects. They do not own each other. They do not possess each other. They cannot trick each other out by court process. They don't view each other as numbers on a spreadsheet. Yeah. And by owning someone, you can do that by giving them a title or a name, correct? Absolutely. And that is the action of nomenclature. It's to grasp something and give it a name. And, that, and you can read about that in their manifest of, as well, of course, in Genesis. Um, you know, Adam, the word Adam means man, by the way, Adam was given the power, power, not the authority, power to name all things in the garden. And this is after the garden is already taken by the landlord. It comes in and offers you pretty shiny things. And when you patronize it, well, it's his garden. You know, I noticed that, you know, yeah, because I've read the Bible a few times and I think it's in Genesis, there's a, they, they mention two types of, there's the mention of God, and then there's the Lord God. Absolutely, and, and they do the same thing with the story of Job throughout the Bible, they've done the same thing. The priests, scribes, and Pharisee, of course, are psychiatrists, media theory, and you've got the attorneys. They're all working against you as your adversary, that's what Satan means, it means your adversary. And as they're doing this, they're dropping God's name, but it's actually the Lord God. And Jesus delineates between the two in 1 Corinthians 6. He said, you can only fornicate by giving your body to the Lord God. And God hath both raised up the Lord God, so shall he raise us up by his own power. And now going back to the preamble to the Constitution and the, the original articles of the Constitution, what did we do? We vested authority in Congress. Congress means with transgression. That's your transgressor. Not a good thing, and uh, we've had demonstrations of that, you know, throughout the existence of the of the country, and recently with the uh, default or whatever you want to call it, the uh, threat of the shutdown of government, which I would look at as saying, you know, once again, trying to say, uh, push people in the corner for more reliance upon the govern government using the uh, Megalian dialectic. Absolutely. You know, and, and that's what we were speaking about um, a moment ago is the implication of these natural disasters against you or this, this harm upon you. The minute you feel like you're being harmed or you experience that harm, what's happening is that 
um, you're automatically engineered by education to rely on the same predator that's preying on you. But it's like asking the wolf to guard the hen house over and over and over and over again. That's not a good deal for the hens. No. Uh, it's not a good deal. All hmm. the children. Absolutely not. And that's why we do what we do. We have an obligation to the babies to save them from being stock options upon their birth. This is ridiculous. And it's really something nowadays how, you know, at one time, I'm, you know, being the age I am and having uh, nieces and stuff born, you know, years in recent times, how they actually issued a social security number to a newborn. How does that tie in with the birth certificate and the uh, the insurance? Or what is that all about? Do you have any idea? Well, it goes all the way back to the Coronation Charter. At the Charter of Liberties or the Coronation Charter, the king came in and said, I'm going to take all over the females' estates, but only if their husbands die. At that point in time, they killed off all of the husbands, so the estates only belonged to the females, but they were kept in shadow forever. As you go out through the history of time, or history as you know it, you know, we come in with the Versailles treaties and everything else, they own her water, the, the birth canal. So the minute the child is born, it's already assigned by her, the informant, it's written on the uh, manufacturer's statement of origin, as well as on the docking instrument, which is a birth certificate. When you give that child a legal name, it becomes a franchise for the United States Incorporated. Now, this coronation chart I have up here, it was granted, it's done by King Henry I, yes. granted August 5th, A.D. 1100. Absolutely, and when you read through Matthew 27 and the coronation charter at the same time, you realize that is the crucifixion of Christ. I find this one, this is, I think it's, I don't know, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if it's three or five in the coronation chart. It says, and if any of my barons or other tenants will have to give his daughter, sister, niece, or kinswoman in marriage, let him speak with me about it. But I will neither take anything from him for this permission, nor prevent his giving her unless he should be minded to join her to my enemy. Right. And that's controlling her. The, the, the king is saying at that point in time that is his female, and he's dictating who she can and who she cannot marry at the same time, which is what the concept of a marriage license is. You know, you've got uh, blood testing and genetic testing, and then, you know, at the, at the outset, I don't know if you've ever been married or not, but you've got a priest telling you it's okay for you to kiss a bride now. So so now you can rent that female and enter into an adhesion contract. You can rent it from its father just for a short amount of time. Now, and that goes over into the uh, saboteur aspect of what the female has been social engineered to be as the quote, Eve. When she uh, becomes that bruise on your heel, the word saboteur stems from the word sabot, or uh, sabot, which it means wooden shoe. Now, she's been in social engineered to go after your stuff while working for the other father because as a beneficiary under the action of low intensity conflict and, and the use of hearts and minds against her, she's absolutely become your your enemy. I mean, that's your enemy because she, she's the one that's delivering you up. She's the one that's delivering the children up without even realizing it most often. Yes, it's quite a uh, underhanded technique. Absolutely. They're, they're getting at the female and the children and removing you, the male, which is the firstborn son, the metaphor of the firstborn son, so that you're not able to stand up against him. And that's what the use of no no fault divorce, uh, emergency restraining orders and all of these things is to move you away from the ability to protect the home and family which is your instinct which has been really the core of the of humanity from the beginning absolutely I mean that's the garden once once she buys into what the snake in the garden has to offer her she removes you from the garden and she's giving that garden away to the snake in the garden 
by adhering to its word rather than yours. Want a bite of the apple, huh? That's almost the same thing like the uh, Hansel and Gretel. Would you like some cookies or Snow White with the, with the apple or things of that nature? Yep, every one of them. And, and of course, those taught her to act like the damsel in distress so that you would run in there under the doctrine of chivalry and protect her. Now, if you are entering into a relationship to save a female, after you've saved her, there's no relationship left. There's already a breakdown going to occur. That's a predetermined outcome. And that's why the attorneys are cashing in on this through divorce court. Yeah, uh, and that's that's a big business, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one-third of the GDP is in taxation and consumption. One third of the global GDP is in the medical psychological industries, and one third is in the legal process, criminalization. Those are all the forms of production. There is no other form of production on this planet. So what happens is is that the people are the ones who really do their lack of a better, you know, using phraseology, sweat of their brow, make everything, and then the middleman a.k.a. also known as the law merchant, comes in and gets the uh, lion's share of everything. Absolutely. 90%. They've been embezzling 90% from the Treasury since the inception of this schematic. And on top of that, they're, they're taking in not only uh, revenue streams and derivatives, but then now you have a sick aspect called the death derivatives. They cash in from birth till death. Yeah, I brought that out on the show about three weeks ago. That's amazing. Who would buy a death derivative against himself? I mean, that uh, it's got to be people with, you know, uh, I guess the means to do so. But that's how, uh, what you call it, the, uh, what's the definition of the Lloyds in London? I believe a group or a conglomerate of uh, investors. That will bet on anything, like in that movie, what was it, uh, Changing Places or Trading Places or something right. like that? And, and part of that group, Lords of London's, is actually you as well, because you are the underwriter. Every time you subscribe, you are underwriting your own policy. You're underwriting the policy. And that's what it says in their original charters. When they entered into a mutual venture with each other, that's a mutual insurance policy. You're, you're underwriting it every time you sign a document for a credit credit card, every time you sign a document for a speeding ticket, when you sign that birth certificate, when you inform on anybody, when you sign a welfare application. And that's what I didn't finish earlier. Uh, when Henry Kissinger came in and said depopulation should be the highest priority of all foreign policy in 74, he's the one that created the Office of Population Affairs by which to de, uh, depopulate in the United States. That Office of Population Affairs, if you go there right now, you will find that that is the Department of Social and Health Services. Every time you apply for welfare benefits, every time you apply for Social Security, every time you apply for SSI or any help whatsoever, you are scheduled for death through the medical, psychological, and criminal industries and the revenue streams that are created in between. Those are the hedge funds, for example. So you're maintaining not only this policy, a mutual venture, an insurance policy, you're also hedging the bet based on your predetermined outcome by simply holding on to these concepts. You're gonna defend the title. I'm a good mom, I'm a good dad, I'm a good girl, I'm a good boy. Every time you buy into those concepts and go ahead and prove your value, you are generating revenue. If you drop those names, which is what Jesus said, divest yourself of all that possesses you, then it stops. You are no longer predetermined and they can no longer guarantee your productive value. Now, how does that tie in, say, between the uh, public law versus commercial acts and private acts? Private acts and acts of com or commercial acts and private acts. Private acts are, are um, executive orders which don't have any bearing on the public side. 
and acts of commerce are not under the public law because they benefit a foreign nation as defined under 28 USC 97. They do not benefit you, the United States, a being. They benefit corporations. Sounds like something really sneaky going on here. Well, absolutely. And when you go visit their um, directives, 27 CFR 72.11, and the uh, definition of what a commercial crime is, uh, it kind of sums it all up, and I'm, I'm going there now. Yeah, I got my little cheat sheet here, too. Yep. Well, the definition, quote, commercial crimes, any of the following types of crimes, federal or state, colon, offenses against the revenue laws. Now, let that sink in for a minute. Offenses against the revenue laws. That means that somebody is charging you for undercutting them in their business model. Now, these offenses are defined as burglary, counterfeiting, forgery, kidnapping, larceny, robbery, illegal sale or possession of deadly weapons, prostitution, including soliciting, procuring, pandering, white slaving, keeping house of ill fame, and like offenses, extortion, swindling, and confidence games, and attempting to commit, conspiring to commit, or compounding any of the foregoing crimes. Addiction to narcotic drugs and use of marijuana will be treated as if it were a commercial crime. They're saying that if you're if you're trafficking in drugs or each other, you're undercutting their business model. Hmm. So that's an admission of guilt that Congress is right out of the Code of Federal Regulations. That Congress is human trafficking. They are prostituting. They are kidnapping. They are forging. They are committing la r larceny and robbery. They are perpetrating keeping houses of ill fame, extortion, and especially the confidence games because insurance is all in risk. That's one big gamble. Unless you have the ability to promote broadcasting and education across the board whereby you, you lessen the risk because you're teaching the product what to be by television programming and radio broadcasting on a grand scale through the Central Intelligence Agency, which is a production company, feeding you artificial intelligence. That's what that is. The CIA is a production company. The product is intelligence. They're filling you up with artificial intelligence through their pedagogy programs. Now, education stems from that word pedagogy, meaning attendance on boys. That is how to break you by educating you and teaching you these concepts by which they can own you. Ooh, you've, been, you've been at this quite some time, haven't you? It'll be 14 years coming up soon. It's been a yeah, long journey. Not, uh, well, I mean, let's see, not white, but I appreciate the amount of effort that you use to... Uh, Explain what you did, what you are explaining. Plus, also give the references. I always wondered, uh, you know, why stuff like this, which is you know useful in, in a person's life, was never uh, addressed in any kind of academic environment. And uh, I guess unless you made the F, you know, you something happened to you that, that involved you in the situation or something like that, or. Uh, you can call it an interest in it, uh, you would really never know. Right, and and that's the saddest thing. You've got the upper 3%, which are the psychopaths. They've got Yale and Harvard education, Stanford educations. And you know, when I was first approached um, years and years ago with my educational background, you know, I see the uh, attempt at induction, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about the... Uh, for example, I was handed the compendium to um, the uh, Population Bomb, which is called Population Matters, you know, and it, it's got John Cornyn, or uh, not John Cornyn, Holdren dancing around in there, you know, hanging out with uh, Ulrich and the others and, and um, promoting the eugenics agenda and the eugenics uh, program itself. And, and, you know, of course... Uh, automatically, instinctually, this thing makes me sick, so of course I'm going to uh, deny them uh, the 
you know, ability to induct me. But then, you know, of course, after that, uh, uh, unlucky things start to occur and my car breaks down and, you know, all of these things. And, and all of it is maintaining under fourth generation warfare. So the further you are out from the uh, main stream, like mainlining a drug, uh, television programming and everything else, the more they're going to work on garnering you back into the system, putting more force onto you, putting more pressure onto you. And eventually, you know, they, they uh, hit my house, they destroyed my house for me, they attempted on me. And the resultant uh, reactive behavior normally would have been that I would have ran right into the system's arms, the same predator that was preying on me. But by that time, you know, I'd had my, they killed my husband back in 2000, and I'd been, you know, made aware of, of this process throughout a pattern of behavior throughout time. So at that time, you know, of course, I'm going to go further away from it, but normally or, or what appears to be naturally, it doesn't happen that way because it's so subtle and it's long term terrorism implicated against human beings where the, the, it's just a natural occurrence oh I just I don't know what I did wrong it must be God's mad at me or whatever and they're, they find so many different justifications to explain away all of these happenings when in reality it's all the same predator prey, preying on you and I and the children yeah, it's, the, it's the children thing that really uh uh, gets to me because the population uh, as the man in the boat is saying at 6 o'clock. Can you stay with me a little longer, Tammy? Yep, that's great. Okay, thank you. Uh, the population in the country has, it, hasn't it dwindled dramatically in the last uh, 20 to 30 years? Absolutely. When you go to the raw data, uh, we're dwindling 3 million a year, and we're not overcoming the birth rate. We're not able to compensate for those lost numbers. But again, the directives came back in the 60s with Ulrich, uh, the population bomb, the whole indoctrinated theory of environmentalism, allowing us to look over at our brothers and sisters and, and consider them even for an instant useless bread gobblers. The incidence rate of now we're, we're promoting eugenics through, quote, assisted suicide programs and, and euthanasia, which sounds so much better than murder, uh, cold-blooded murder. And these things, the abortion rate itself, one, over one million abortions are performed in the United States Incorporated each and every year. And now we're finally getting to the bottom of these things where these are forced abortions. These are forced upon these children. And, and, and not very often is it, is it consensual with children. Yes, that, that, you know, that woman that's out messing around on her husband, she's going to go out and garner an abortion because she doesn't want proof of the, the affair. Th those are lesser known occurrences, although they do happen according to the Guttmacher uh, Institute, which maintains the uh, statistics on, on such things like that. And um, it's just, it's foul. It's absolutely foul what they've, been able to do just based on consent. Consent, yes. And one of the biggest things uh, that I find uh, most people, due to the indoctrination or the, I guess, go along to get along attitude, is the unwillingness to dissent. Absolutely. Because I think it's in the law, isn't it? If you don't dissent, then you're presumed to be consenting. Absolutely, and that comes right out of Bouvier's maxims as adapted to the United States Constitution. Uh, consent is presumed by law unless express dissent is made known. And so all this time, you know, you, you, you look over and you see, well, there's a corrupt law enforcement, there's a corrupt uh, senator, there's a corrupt this or that, and you think, well, you know, that's just, that's just sick. But what are you actually doing about it other than complaining? You're not holding them accountable until now. We, we did uh, win the case against them uh, in August, and then the resultant was that they were found guilty by the evidence of being the perpetrator of genocide. But, it, you know, just to get out of the mindset that you are, you know, lesser than government is, is something that's 
it's a hard hurdle to get over because you've been taught to be bowing down to it, to subscribe to that thing, to underwrite the policy. Yes, it's a it's a like a one hat fits all type of system, and know your place. And once again, going back to the Constitution, the uh, that Fourteenth Amendment, the uh, citizen, which is actually the status of second class. Absolutely, in the Fourteenth Amendment, the person was is a corporation. It is not, that's not the citizen. That's not the citizen. Um, let me get to it real quick, and I'll read it. When you actually read it, a citizen is one that's born and naturalized here. Um, section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Period. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States semicolon now what immunities and privileges are they talking about they're talking about the the little crap rights that they gave you free speech you have a right to free speech now the next part of that is something that most people are not aware of nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law now you're not a cit you're a citizen. You're not a person. The person is a corporation. So at that time, the corporations came in and said, "We'll gladly take over from here. We'll be you." And they got your life while you've been used to maintain them on corporate welfare. And going back to the Fourteenth Amendment, of course, three days prior was the Expatriation Act, which allowed the attorney to expatriate and patriate under the Bar Association. President Lincoln was, of course, clergy for Congress. On the other flip side of things, he was a credit reporter for Dun & Bradstreet, just as much as Taft was, and I think it was Garfield in there. Uh, they were credit reporters for Dun & Bradstreet. They cashed in on all of these things. And again, this year, uh, of course, we were watching uh, the indoctrination in full swing when they came out with a brand new movie called... Uh, Lincoln the Vampire, Abraham Lincoln the Vampire Slayer. So, of course it wasn't Congress that was doing all these things against you. It was vampires. Right, yeah. Well, the, what I'm saying, when you read the, uh, the organic laws, I think there's four of them, the Articles of Confederation, it, it specifically states that Congress is in charge of all of this. Absolutely, and, it, and it's maintained again... You know, uh, after they had sewn everything up, 1941 Atlantic Charter, Congress, the person or the people are choosing their own form of government. And this was entered into by Roosevelt, the president then, and Winston Churchill. And that's when, of course, England was also usurped by Congress. Congress has had world governance since 1941 Atlantic Charter. And they're maintaining under Malthusian theory... Uh, under the Mal uh, Master Lend Lease Agreement of 1942, which goes right d directly back to Thomas Malthus and the nature of rent. Yeah, to me, it's been, you know, I've made many comments on it. It's basically a, a big layoff like a book you would do with a bet. Absolutely. And when you go all the way back to what it is, and it's called the Exchequer. Uh, anybody can Google the dialogue of the Exchequer, and you'll realize right away it's just a game of chess and risk. Here you have, you're on a spreadsheet, you're on the board, you are actually a piece on the board, and you've got the directors moving you around, they're players on the game, until now. We went ahead and took over the Exchequer uh, back in August, on behalf of the United States of Being. So what you're saying, a state of being is actually each human. Absolutely, but together. We, we are, we've are we always been together until they divide us through the use of nomenclature. Calling you a male, calling me a female, calling us white, black, purple, red, green, whatever. Calling us Jew, Christian, Muslim, 
whatever, all of these things work to divide us from the whole or the one. And they run off with all the goods while everybody else kills each other. Absolutely, and and that was what you saw in the uh, revolution and then uh, of course in the Civil War. That had nothing to do with us. They were telling us that we, we like slavery over here, we don't like slavery over here. When in reality that was Congress enacting laws that maintained that slavery was lawful or legal at that time. And then they pit us against each other, law enforcement and citizens, and ha had us kill each other. And they do that every time they need to cut the overhead. Yeah, it looks like they got one basic uh, playbook. Absolutely. And that's played over and over again. Let me read the Article 12 of the uh, Articles of Confederation. Uh, it says, All bills of credit emitted, monies borrowed, and debts contracted by or under the authority of Congress before the assembling of the United States. Now, from what I read on that, it's pretty well uh, cut and dry. It says the authority of Congress before they assembled. Right. And, and that's what it says in the very first inception of the Articles of Confederation. The United States of America is a style. All it is is chain of events or actions of Congress. It's not a geographical location. The geographical that, location that they've claimed is actually in the meantime. It's, it's by time zones, the concept of time zones. So you'll see in all of the treaties and, and all of your court orders... Uh, these, this judge will say, well, in the meantime, that means that you've been subdued by a concept uh, maintaining a location. One well, words, big mess, isn't it? Right, words are money. If you go to the uh, dialogue of the exchequer, uh, part, uh, let me see, it's uh, part 14 is thesaurus okay what is a thesaurus in your mind what do you know a thesaurus as as a what i'm sorry a thesaurus most people know a thesaurus as uh something well, I got right here on the table and occasionally when we run across words that i find funny when we do the morning show and read the news i use it it's more of a uh i would say uh a more expanded dictionary Right. Well, words are actually money, and in ti uh, part 14 of the Dialogue of the Exchequer, there is the definition of thesaurus, quote, that thesaurus sometimes means the money itself, sometimes the place where it is kept, such as mean time. Quote, no moreover that thesaurus sometimes mean the money and cash itself as well, as well as gold or silver vessels of different kinds and changes of vestments, which of course you know them as garments. According to this ex acceptation, it is said, quote, where thy treasure is, there will thy heart be also. And quote, for thesaurus is called the place in which it reposes, therefore thesaurus, or arithaurus, namely the place of gold. So that if one asks about someone where he is, it may not be incongruously be, be replied, he is in the, quote, thesaurus, that is, in the place where the thesaurus is kept. Cash money indeed, or the other things mentioned, having once been put in a safe place, are not taken away except when by mandate of the king. They are sent to him to be distributed for his necessary uses. But there are many things in the repository vaults of the treasury which are carried around, and they are shut up and guarded by the treasurer and the chamberlains. As has been more fully shown above, such are the seal of the king concerning what thou, thou cost ask the doomsday book, the so-called exactory roll, which some name the writ of farms, Likewise, the great yearly pipe rolls, the rolls of accounts, a numerous multitude of privileges, counter tallies of receipts, and rolls of receipts, and writs of the king concerning outlays of the treasury, and many other things, which, when the exchequer is in session, are necessary to its daily uses. Every time, every time you buy a concept, you're purchasing it from the law merchant. That is I see a form it. I'm of reading money. along with you. 
as you were reading, and it actually says that. It says the Ori thesis, A-U-R-I-T-H-E-S-I-S, namely the place of gold. That is the place of gold. Every concept that you buy, you're buying that from that snake in the garden. You're buying it from the law merchant. And then it'll sell you rights and benefits to come along with that concept. And of course, you're going to be in court purchasing those things. You're going to rush right out and purchase those things. I got to have it. I want my rights. I want my rights. They have more than me. They have more than me. And that's what the whole aspect of the Federal Reserve is. It's a reservation of rights superior to another, whereby the other sect can be redistributed by legal process. So within feminism, that redistributes the male. Masculism redistributes the, the female. You have Zionism that redistributes the Muslim. You have Islamism that re redistributes the Jew. Catholicism redistributes the Jew. Ju Judaism redistributes Catholicism. Environmentalism redistributes corporatism. Communism redistributes individualism. These are all concepts sold to you by which you're purchasing from the law merchant along with purchasing the rights that are then created after that. Hmm. And that, that's been, uh, you know, uh, well, those are recent, some of, some of the uh, terminology that you use, those are recent uh, feminism, communism, th those are more recent modern terms. Right, the terms are, but not the action, because Rome was brought down, of course, by the lawlessness of the female. She was also reserved back then, but it wasn't called feminism. The male was moved out of placement. I mean, he was all fighting wars and everything else for three and four years at a time, whereby the females and the children could be preyed on, but they were given the, the utmost liberality. And, if, you know, same thing during the... Um, uh, French Revolution, 1798, you brought in the uh, Burgoy Constitution, so that's liberalism. So she's given full-on lawlessness to do whatever she's going to do, and that becomes the stickler, because then she can, of course, purchase all those rights, you can purchase all your rights while yours are stolen, and she's not held accountable, so she's going to be even easier to manipulate under the action of hearts and minds. As long as you give her a benefit, She's going to do what the, the daddy government wants, and, and that's uh, purely manipulation under uh, fourth-generation warfare, psychological warfare itself. Now, that was used, uh, I think the, the British used that, that technique, didn't they? Absolutely, uh, during the Malayan emergency. And just this year, they were talking about the... Uh, uh, Malays, the Malay females now are being held in prison concentration camps and their rights are being stolen because they turned it around on them. They needed them to accept these things during the 1980s, uh, late 70s, uh, early 80s. They had gone into uh, uh, and, and confiscated the Malaysian uh, females by offering them food stamps and medical and, and uh, you know, you name it under the guise of welfare. Well, now they're they're living in concentration camps, and this is being reported on this year, as a matter of fact. I think it was Bo that covered that uh, about a month ago. Yeah, and I, I noticed here yeah, it says, uh, and this is from the reference in the Wikipedia, it says, the program was inspired by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Absolutely. Huh. Absolutely. And when yeah, you go back... I, I recall, you know, being a... a uh, a youngster then, and they never had too many credit cards of everything. Everything else was set up on payment plans you paid by the week or the month or, or whatever the, uh, just how it was done there. I remember when, I can recall the first time a credit card came out, I think it was a Sears credit card. Well, I guess now it's no longer uh, in business. Right. And, and yeah. you go back to before that time, everything was done on... On if you can't afford it, you don't need it. And then all of a sudden there's credit credit being established, the concept of credit. Of course, nobody realizes the back end of credit is debt. They're coming up against your good word, your goodwill, and, and establishing all these debt uh, notes, such as the Federal Reserve note and everything else. But these concepts throughout the spread of time have to be created in the mind by which to make the human more malleable and more able to enter into this system, be a product. 
You know, you've got to keep up with the Joneses. They've got a bigger boat than you got. They've got a bigger house than you got. Their kids are dressed better than your kids. So you've got to rush out and get some credit here and, and enter into some debt. Otherwise, you're you're not a very good product. Not producing anything if you're not consuming. Yep, you have to be that consumptive good. That's what that's called. It's a consumptive good. That's a human being uh, consuming. And there's all kinds of ways for consumption, even including education, not just the uh, bells and whistles and, you know, cars. and Right. It Every goes, it goes, it, it's, it's so prolific that it's uh, like being in that matrix. Absolutely, which means artificial womb. That's what it is. You are in an artificial womb. They're offering you all these shiny baubles and trinkets, and, and those are the concepts that you're buying. You're buying concepts. And and that's what, uh, you know, John Jesus was so adamant about in uh, Revelation 18. He says, when you stop buying from that law merchant, it goes off wailing. It's crying. It cannot, uh, it can no longer sustain itself if you stop buying those concepts. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know how many times the, uh, I the last time, uh, the 33 bankruptcy, but I remember early in the program we were talking about the UCC. Mm -hmm. Now I have this, this is called the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966. And I you know, went around asking questions on this to you know, different people as far as maybe even stockbrokers and at the bank, the bankers and stuff like that, inquiring about the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. Right. And it says here that the entire taxing and monetary systems are hereby placed under the UCC, or Uniform, Uniform Commercial Code. And this is the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966. That's recently. Right. And it is. And I'll read from uh, Amger 2D uh, Bills and Notes uh, to get everybody uh, up to speed. Now, the number one definitions, nature of commercial paper, subsection 1, 2, Subsection 1, generally. Bills and notes in their various forms are contracts. and may be negotiable or non-negotiable. Bills and notes are commonly defined as commercial paper, negotiable or non-negotiable instruments, and in turn, commercial paper is commonly defined as negotiable instruments, drafts, checks, certificates of deposits, and promissory notes. Commercial paper is governed by the provisions of Article 3 of the Com Uniform Commercial Code. As to the relationship of Article 3 to the other articles in the Uniform Commercial Code, see section, subsection 17 of the contractual nature of negotiable instruments. Bills and notes, or in modern terminology, drafts, checks, notes, and certificates of deposits are contracts. Accordingly, the fundamental rules governing contract law are applicable to the determination of the legal questions which arise over the instruments. Now, the next section is subsection 3, generally, the law merchant. The law merchant is the law which confers negotiability on commercial paper and governs negotiable instruments. More specifically, it is the pre-statutory or non-statutory law which governs bills of exchange and promissory notes, namely the lex mercatoria or the customs of merchants, and is the basis for the modern statutes on the subject. The Uniform Negotiable Instrument Act and the Uniform Commercial Code, which in large major but not entirely provide the law governing commercial paper. Bills and notes were developed under the law merchant as convenient instrumentalities of trade and commerce, and it was the necessities of such trade and commerce which impressed upon them the unique quality of the consequences of negotiability. They were intended as substitutes for money in commercial transactions and by the understanding and usage of those employing them, were closely assimilated to money. Subsection 4, Uniform Negotiable Instrument Acts. The Uniform Commercial Code supplanted the Uniform Negotiable Instrument Act, which was promulgated in 1896 as the first, quote, uniform law by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws and was in force in all the states of the United States until superseded. The act was largely a codification of the laws of the law merchant or the common law rules regulating the negotiable instruments 
which previously were in force in effect by virtue of judicial pronouncement or legislative enactment. Its purpose was to establish certain fixed rules governing negotiable instruments and to bring about a uniform system of laws on the subject and thereby do away with the confusion that had existed in the law of commercial paper. The act did not apply to or affect the rights or liabilities of persons on paper that was not within its meaning negotiable, but if it was a negotiable instrument within the meaning of the act, then in the absence of any special statutory provisions governing such inf instrument, the rights and liabilities of the parties of, to the instrument were fixed and determined by the provision of, of the act alone. Now, you come down to B, Section B, the Uniform Commercial Code, number one in general, subsection five through nine, subsection five generally. The Uniform Commercial Code has been enacted at least in part by every state in the United States and by the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands. The Uniform Commercial Code is arranged in 10 articles. Article 1 contains general provision. Article 10 is the effective date and repealer article. And Articles 2 through 9 are each concerned with a particular type of commercial activity. The Code as a whole is known and may be cited as the Uniform Commercial Code. The Uniform Commercial Code as proposed by its sponsors which are the American Law Institute and the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, is accompanied by extensive comments explanatory of and correlating the various code provisions. The official comments are not part of the code in the sense that they are not enacted by the state legislatures adopting the code, but the comments may be restored by, to by the courts as an aid in construction. Now, when you realize that UCC is the Negotiable Instrument Acts, and when you go into Black's Law Dictionary, such as to find that, you know, the court is defined as a bank, and when you put yourself in front of the court, you're there as a deposit under action of nomenclature, you realize right away who the Lord God is and who your enemy is. It's quite something, yes, and this goes back, this law merchant thing goes all the way back. Doesn't it come from the east somewhere? Well, it was all a manufactured um, Merchants. presentation, right, and it, it was always the same. They would steal us on ships and transport us around, teach us a new culture, language, religion, you know, all of these constructs by which we would patronize them. Well, at one point in time, we realized we're slaves. We realized they're holding us in the keel of the ship. We realized, or the hold of the ship, the hole, which is the exchequer. We realized these things. And we, when, when our numbers reach uh, extension, we, we push back. Now, under this type of system, now we have the silent weapon. You don't know you're being attacked. You don't know you're being kidnapped. You don't know your children are being human trafficked by legal process. All of these things are quiet. You just think you have really bad luck or you did something wrong to deserve it. And that goes back to the indoctrination set up with, ed with the educational system along with religious indoctrination teaching you that you're a bad boy or a bad girl when you rely on this. And then you start blaming yourself rather than the perpetrator. Looking for uh, not believing your eyes or... Well, in a way, teaching you belief, you know, Jesus was so ticked off about that one because the word belief stems from the word beloved, to be gone from the self. And Jesus... And I know was, it also means it doesn't require any evidence. Absolutely. And, and that's what they've done. They've, they've used consensus reality against us. And, and uh, I think it was more profound and, and able to be... Um, seen in a clear manner when Joseph Goebbels said that. Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister and he maintained that if you repeat a lie often enough it becomes the truth and that's what they've done. It's just consensus reality. Using, using the natural things that people do which is speech or you know language and then uh, knowing that uh, somehow or another when it's passed down one to, to the other, you know, the story expands or you omit some things or add some things to it, and you're really not focused on the actual usage or the exactness of what's going on. Absolutely, and, and of course speech 
um, it's hard to explain where speech comes from, but um, Hobbes describes it in uh, his article uh, from um, the Leviathan uh, or the Matter of uh, Form and Power uh, by Thomas Hobbes back in 1591, chapter 4 of speech. Do I have time to read from that? Sure, yeah. I read, I read some of that about uh, three weeks ago. Right, and it and it, it opens your eyes to a whole nother level because you're you're reading it as from the concept side, you know. And um, chapter four of speech, the invention of printing through ingenious, compared with the invention of letters, is no great matter. But who is the first that found the use of letters is not known. He that first brought them into Greece, men say, was Cadmus, the son of Agenor king of Phoenicia, and in reality, when you go back to Homer, Homer himself, the Iliad, and the, um, what was the other one, the Odyssey, those are the original texts, everything else stems from those, and then you go back to the Homeric hymns, and you can find where the text of the Bible stem from, you can find the Quran is right there, you know, all of these things are created as, such as the Great Retta, it's just a speech, that's all it is, over and over again, and, and, um, when you go to uh, Plato's hand in all of this, Aristotle's hand in all of this, uh, the Apology of Socrates comes to mind most often because you've got a man there that was charged with perverting the minds of children and he stands up and he starts an oration. Oh, men of Athens, we have to be proud here. I'm such a proud citizen. He's being tried and he's, he's facing execution. And he's still being patriotic, you know. And that, and that was something that was was very interesting to um, delve into, you know, again, the Republic and the, all of these things that engineered society to maintain a form of government when reality, when you go back to the Greek um, on demo, meaning people, and kratos means to control or possess. So you've got democracy as the action of controlling and possessing people, period. And a republic is to see it again. It's not a public it's a republic being represented in another way. Right. Well, let me ask you this question. All of this sounds all nice and everything like that. What if some, if, if other humans or other beings say, well, it don't mean a hill of beans. Well, how would you respond to that? Well, Jesus said, dust off your shoes and go elsewhere. You don't cast your pearls to swine and let the dead bury their own dead. Huh. Blind leading the blind, huh? Right, right. You know, we might be able to circle back later if there's an opportunity, but from what we've seen throughout history and what's happening now, those individuals that are of that mindset are fully integrated with the system. They're already being killed through the medical, psychological, and criminal industries. They're already being destroyed, and so you just have to let the dead bury their own dead. We don't have time to go back at this point in time because we're still trying to save the children. You know, the children are the most important. So so the adults that don't want to put the time in to, to look at these things and to realize what's going on, we're going to have to just let them go until later, and possibly we may be able to circle back. But uh, in the meantime, it's it's awful to watch what happens to them and what does occur as they're killed through the uh, medical industry or they're taken and institutionalized through the psychological, psychological industry or they're criminalized and, and just beat down and, and imprisoned it through the criminal industry. And all of these things are just horrifying for me to witness, but that's what you're buying into. That's what you're consenting to if you're in that situation until you realize. And at that point, you know, then what? You know, and and and, and that's the saddest thing is that we've come across this so often. And people come in head to head with us, and especially agents uh, trying to slow us down and stop us from holding them accountable. Uh, they say that quite often. Well, okay, you're just you're just full of hot air. Well, here's here's the 1794 Treaty of Amity and commerce and navigation, maintaining that they're human trafficking. Here's here's their works and actions that are, is evidence that you, the human being, are being trafficked. And, you know, if you don't want to see it, that's okay. But it, it's a good idea for you to open your eyes and, and find these things. And, and that's what we, we do most often at ChooseYourSide.org or TabbyPepperman.org or on Skype or 
wherever else. We're trying to allow everybody the same opportunity at the same time to step out of this system. Free will, the expression of free will. Absolutely. And that's what it, you know, it says that in Revelation, uh, when the angel is standing on the, uh, the earth and the, and the sea at the same time, and, and the, uh, the angel hands the lamb a, a scroll, and he says, eat it up. It's going to be like honey on the tongue, but it's going to be bitter on the belly. Of course this is hard to swallow, but after that, it's up to you if you go one way or the other. That's, that's, it's now when that time is occurring. Choose your side. You're either going to patronize that Lord God, or you're going to patronize God. It, there's no other option, because one, you're going to end up like Job. Two, you're going to end up like God. There's there's not a, a you know, a, a light line in between there. There's a very significant line drawn in the sand. Yeah. And I know, it was years ago, I made a comment to one person one time about how you, most human beings are in the state of uh, Stockholm Syndrome. Right, and and that's what we're trying to overcome uh, when they realize, you know, and, and that's what we teach daily. When they, when you start to realize the fourth generation warfare, psychological warfare, asymmetrical warfare, low intensity conflict being used against you, it's time to hold them accountable rather than playing the victim. Oh, wow, wow, wow! They're 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 surveilling me. Wow, wow, wow! You know, they they won't let me have my privacy. That's a concept. Wow, wow, wow. You know, all of these things are used to control the population under the Federal Emergency Management Act. And, of course, that goes right back to Matthew 27 and the crucifixion of Christ, the governor being the pilot or the ship steerer. And a statute uh, defined is a statement of compulsion. That's what it does. It pulls you around like a little tugboat around that lighthouse. They're offering you the lighthouse. And when you buy into it, you're buying from the law merchant. Like it was said on Johnny Carson one time, if you buy the premise, you buy the bit. Absolutely. And, and it's horrifying to watch. And I'm praying and praying that other people wake up. Well, uh, it's, it's really something. Uh, it, it's quite a dilemma. Uh, I, you know, I've been doing this for quite some time. And uh, like I said, I was very happy when I ran when I ran across the, you and and and, few, and a few others in the same pursuit. Uh, the public law. Absolutely, that's all there is. Okay, the public law though is it made of statutes and codes and regulations, or what? What, what does it consist of as far as uh, the makeup of it? The public law only adheres to the human being, so it provides for the well-being of the human, and it means do no harm. That's it. So that would that would fall under the general welfare, then? Absolutely. Huh. And the, uh, what well, you said, the statute is a uh, act of uh, compulsion. Right, act of, com and, and it's under commercial acts and, and private acts. You know, you go back to... 27 CFR 72.11. How the heck can we come from a place where, you know, at one point in time a human being can be harmed to now a human being can be injured, that word means brought into law, and now we have the ability of a stop sign to be injured or a red light to be injured when we roll through it. You know, all of these concepts sold to us, and the more we buy them, the, the richer they become. Yeah, it's basically just a way to uh, shear the sheep, huh? Absolutely. It's a means and mechanisms of the wolf to get out the hen house. Hmm. I'll tell you what, you know, it, uh, and with the economy in the shape that it's in right now, uh, uh, last time I heard there's over six million laws on the books. Absolutely. For what purpose? It's only to line that attorney's pocket. It's for the negotiorum gestio to, to spin around and around in that marquee. It's just an illusion. Yeah, because they do what they call represent you, and they tell you, you know, they, I guess that's what part of the big uh, resurgence was, I guess, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years with people uh, rep uh, presenting themselves or 
just like anything else. I mean, no one can speak for you but yourself. Isn't that uh, pretty well known? Absolutely. And that's what Jesus was so adamant about. Know thyself. Don't ask somebody to represent you. First Corinthians 6 is what... He says, what the heck are you guys doing? You're going into these courts of law. You're asking them to decide your matters. Don't you know that you're going to be judging saints? Yeah, it's also known as uh, one's conscience. Absolutely. And, and the obligation that we have to humankind. We have an obligation to see ourselves into the future. And at this time, we're being depopulated by psychopathy. And attorneys are getting rich on this. I'll tell you what, every time, you know, I mean, uh, I know here locally that there, there's some things. There was something locally in the paper today. I don't know if you saw it in your area. It was about the, uh, it said, the House Senate leaders reach a budget deal. Yeah. It, it says, uh, Congressional negotiators Tuesday reaching a deal to keep the government running for nearly two more years. A rare bipartisan agreement that should ease the threat of automatic spending cuts. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this ties in with the uh, uh, legal case that you had filed. Absolutely. And when we went against them, they can only get funding if they adhere to the public law. And so all of their side show there is, is nothing but a side show, when in reality... Back at the government shutdown, they were given $313 billion through the Treasury, and that was it. That doesn't even cover their overhead. And right now, they've got, they're asking for private donations. You can see this all over everywhere. That's actually aiding and abetting the known enemy to humankind. So we want everybody aware of these things. And they were also uh, denied, uh, they, they couldn't pay their dues for, uh, was it UNESCO? Absolutely, and it, and it's gotten worse and worse. They're asking for public donations for their schools, child protective services, adult protection, all of these things. And I need to remind everybody that they have been found guilty of genocide. If you privately donate to them, you are aiding and abetting the known enemy of humankind. That's quite a serious uh, charge there. Absolutely. I'm not joking around. I like humanity. I could care less about politics. Yeah. Politically correct. How long is that, in your recollection, that's been around politically correct? You well, see, around the 80s, I think, is when they started determining and defining human beings as politically, pro uh, politically correct products. Um, you know, we went through feminism and racism and all of these concepts. And at the extension of that was when they started not only claiming that the human had become politically correct, but also there was no, not an eye batted when you were called human resources. You know, you have our human resources department in every form of employment now. And human beings are not opening their eyes to realize that they're being called human resources. Yeah, that was a change in the language itself. At one time, it was the personnel office. Absolutely. The next thing you know, there was a switch to human resource officer. Absolutely. Hmm. And that's one of the things that I find interesting in the, uh, you know, various dictionaries of today. Uh, if you go to a library, most libraries have a older dictionary there, and they, they're quite large. And some of the other dictionaries that you can purchase, they're uh, filtering out, I guess is a, is a term, or actually just changing the meanings of words. Absolutely. They have to keep everybody dumbed down. Um, I suggest for everybody to at least have one copy of Black's Law Dictionary. Um, if you can have more than one, which we offer those uh, through Skype and our various sites, uh, it's best to have first, fourth, and at least like the eighth edition or so, so that you can see throughout time the changes as per the market conditions and how language is used to maintain you as a product. Yeah, it's really something. Uh, I know uh, when I went to school, uh, 
I, I failed English. Thank goodness. <laughs> and, uh, well, what it was was the, uh, I think it was the going to the Shakespeare thing. And, you know, the first ones they made you, you know, was suggested was you know, to go see Romeo and Juliet and all that stuff like that. Right. And that was pretty natural. I, I never saw the big uh, importance of it. Right. Other, other than the political uh, aspect of it where it created the Hatfields and McCoys U.S. style. Absolutely. And that just, that just continues to, see, to be the uh, mechanism of uh, divide and conquer. Absolutely. Constantly. And, and that's why it's it's shifted throughout time you know when you when you start humanity out with the romantic languages for example uh italian french uh spanish those things those are second person languages so you're never outside of the self more than two times when you right. finally get to english english is the language of commerce so at any given moment in time you are four times removed from the self and now you can describe a sunset as appearing to look like a painting, or I can describe a sense of, oh my goodness, that red is on fire. The color red, the concept of the color red, can have actuality and relativity enough to be on fire as well now. I mean, these things, is, this language is so perverse in its ability to move human beings outside of the, the original state of being. It, it's just disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Well, I know that there are, you know, uh, manuals written for various uh, disciplines or uh, using colors. I know they use it in uh, the, uh, what is that, the grocery stores and stuff like that. Uh, Absolutely. To, to make you feel more at ease and I guess easier to, uh, I guess the elevator music type situation put you off guard. Absolutely, and that's called musicology. They're using musicology against people. The, the, the sound of frequency to move you from one state of being to the next because your, your emotions are invoked at those times. You know, you hear a sad piece of music and you're going to go into sadness. If you hear a happy piece, you'll be, uh, you know, maintained in a little bubble-like happy place. Um, you know, when you go down to the um, absolute, that's actually using binary to move you around. I don't know if you remember the old dial-up systems where you can dial up to the internet and you'd hear this whining sound and everything else. Those were all of those uh, Latin accents all at the same time, the, the sounds, the diacritics moving to maintain that uh, uh, a bus line, I think they call it. Uh, no, not a bus line. In that one, through the modem itself. But that's how we we do on a day to day basis. We emote those sounds and move each other outside of our states of being, and it's it's horrifying what they've what they've engineered. That puts me in mind of the dolphins with the uh, sonar. Right. How they, the whales, how they can communicate through the water. Right, and that's how we communicated prior to the onslaught or the imposition of language. We only communicated with each other by frequency. Mm. You know, way back I know when... One time I worked for the phone company and I play a little music. I know the pitch for the dial tone was uh, 440 vibrations per second, which is the uh, tone of A in the, you know, the uh, tuning mechanism used now. Right, and that, that irritates me so bad because it's so far away from the frequency of love, which I think is 528. Uh, you know, you've got, I, I can't stand the upper A. I don't like the, uh, you know, I love G. That's that's just how we are. We're, we're in tune with each other, but we're so outside of that now with the amount of towers that they've got in between us. They're impeding our frequency with their cell phone towers with the Tesla technology and right here you know I'm surrounded by walls you've got 60 cycle energy running through that converting and, and perverting our frequency as well so we're not able to communicate as we once were there's interference absolutely absolutely and that's the action of the ohm and that brings us back to the name itself nomenclature is the ohm that's a form of resistance if if I'm taught that I'm a female, you're taught that you're a male, that concept is, a, is an ohm, it's a resistor. 
And that brings us right back to the silent weapons for quiet wars. That's the whole aspect of energy induction. They create well, that's, an really, own. that's really something because I know that's a uh, electronic circuit. Absolutely. And they use various uh, components in order to get the desired result. Right. And, and, and you can change the circuit by, you know, changing the components. Yep. And it, and it sends you down another channel. It, we were talking earlier about being the vessel on the, the river sticks. You're, you're channeled right down a different venue or another channel each time that there's a resistance thrown in front of you. And that's what Jesus was going off on. He says, you've shut up the, you've shut up the kingdom of heaven. You've just thrown something in my path. And, and when you go down to the physics of the thing, that is called an advertisement. That's with vert. Somebody's altered your heading. Yeah. Oh, Miss Administrator, you want to do me a favor? Talk to Tammy. I have to, excuse me, Tammy. I have to uh, go to the little boys' room in, in, the, in, in the control room right here. Awesome. <laughs> I was... Hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Great, how are you doing? Thank you for... Uh, I'm doing all right. I was trying to uh, hook up an antenna for somebody for Christmas. Uh, just uh, <laughs> listening to the radio all the way all over town. So I want to thank you very much for calling in. It's been a very interesting subject matter tonight. Thank you guys for having me. Um, oh, our pleasure. It's just It's been a long journey. I mean, this, this whole thing, this whole marquee is just... It, it's mind-boggling, but once you get to the origins of it you realize that it's a very small amount of psychopaths running the whole system and it's not bigger than we can take care of because we've we we've you know based on our court orders and the action that we took against congress they were found right. guilty of genocide by the evidence well um what, what is the best advice we can tell you know the younger generation to get involved with their civic duties and responsibilities to understand what the process is going on as you've been explaining for the last you know since the show began, uh, to try to get more people involved, you know, with exactly uh, the lesson of the language and why it has come to pass. That's what I, I've already learned that already in this program, that uh, how things have developed from history, that it's important to know the history lessons, to know where the origins came from to where we're at today. Is that right? Absolutely. And know yourself. That's what Jesus kept saying. Just know your authority. When you're the author and you as a human being, when you're walking along, that is your book. You're writing the book of life just yeah, by right. your, your state of being. And as soon as you realize your authority and you're no longer uh, subverted by another and, and accepting the indoctrination, then it, it becomes easier and easier and easier to hold them accountable. Right. Well, I guess that, that would be having people find their own individuality and leadership in that, that they uh, do their self-investigation to be, you know, an individual, period, to uh, understand what the process is, is and not to be a follower in, much, in a manner of speaking, huh? Right, and, and not to be really an individual, because the individual was created by constitutional theory as much as man was created as a, a legal construct, you know. Once you accept those titles... You've given up all of your authority because you're claiming to be something that they created. Those are concepts. And, and realizing that you're just one. We're all one. It's not a communist theory to realize that you and I are the same. They told us we were different. That's the use of divide and conquer. If we buy into those concepts, we've already been divided. Right. That's, right. that's their key. That's their whole way of functioning is pitting us against each other. And... And we want to disallow that. We want to realize that, you know, the, the elderly are not useless bird gobblers. Children are not bad. You know, when they come out with these uh, massive media presentations telling us that our children are horrifying or they're doing bad things, don't listen. Go to the source. Go Find out what happened to, to uh, Officer Dorner, for example. You know, he turned on his peers. Then they, they, they burned him alive in that house just to vilify him. You know, because he had stood up. You you have to stand as one, not not just thinking as an individual. You have to stand as one and share the same word, which is what Revelation 19 maintains. The rider on the white horse is not some unknown entity. The rider on a white horse, it says, is the word of God. That's just whoever's walking as to the word of God. That's you. You're coming here to save us. Jesus tells us in... Uh, uh, Matthew 18, the Son of Man is 
come to save that which is lost. He didn't say he's coming. He didn't say anything about that. He says, you're, one of these days you're going to wake up and you're going to realize what's written in their book. And when you realize that, then your wrath is made known. You get angry enough to stand up for humanity, for the children. And it's at that point in time that they are held accountable. Oh, absolutely. All right, uh, Al's back in here now, so I want to thank you very much, Tammy, and continue on with the conversation. It's been excellent this evening. Thank you for having me. Be well. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was the, the music maestro here at the, the, uh, the master of the WQRZ Brain Thrust Mothership you were speaking with. Awesome. Otherwise known as Bryce. Yep, awesome. It was great. Yeah, yeah. It's really been a... Uh, and that's with an I, too, boy. And that's, and that's with an I, he says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's uh, really, we're, in, we're in sitting right now in studio number eight since Katrina. Aww. And uh, uh, I guess the water, I'm sitting in the chair right now, the water would be uh, over my waist. Wow. That was in this building. That's yeah. Perfect. That was Isaac, that was, uh, what, a year and a half ago or whatever? Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, Katrina was over the roof. Yeah, Katrina was over the roof. <laughs> wow. That's awful. Yeah, well, that that's what happens down here, uh, you know, in the south with the, uh, you know, the... I guess being down below, you know, close to the equator where the, where the water flows down toward the bottom is a natural thing, you know. Well, and then you have the Corps of Engineers that were at the heart of why the levees broke, why they couldn't sustain that. Then you've got the geoengineering that maintained the flooding aspect through the cloud seeding programs and everything else. And it's just this one big long show. It's just a presentation to see how much you can take calling you Job. Yeah, well, well, he, he, he could tell that they, they did uh, they, 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 uh, a highway known as 603. It's probably uh, maybe a half a mile from here. And they put up a, uh, uh, I guess it was a baffle. And there are bayous on the other side. And when the east wind blows, we get walking. here. Aww. <laughs> we, get Island, it's, uh, we get to play. Boss, boss, the plane. Yep. <laughs> So, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's it, quite an event. It keeps the trolls away. They have to come here by boat. They have yep. to come by boat. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> but, uh, and it goes on. He's been doing this for quite some time. Uh, I got interested that time. I met him for uh, Hurricane Katrina. I watched him uh, uh, put the communication system together was the only one to do it. And uh, he's just a volunteer. That's beautiful. Just a, oh, just an individual who has an interest in electronics. And he's pretty hes pretty good at it, you know? Yeah. That's beautiful. Everybody works together to be just humanity. That's all we're required to do as to the laws of physics. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Well, look, it's getting close. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. All right. I, I really want to thank you for, you know, for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was... It You're was, here. Yeah. And you just got the applause from the porch. We, our green room is outside the four walls right here. It has a porch that, you know, it, it's just a deck outside. Oh. And instead of having a real green room, we just got the, you know couch out there. And we have a beautiful said, canopy and lots of wildlife. Yeah, we've got beautiful canopy and lots of wildlife to observe. <laughs> but it's all right. You know, everything uh, goes through cycles, ups and downs, but, you know, we keep plugging away at it. Yep. We've got friends down there that keep inviting us down, but I haven't had time to, you know, allow for a, a long trip. But one of these days, hopefully, we can all see, see each other and speak in real time. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you know, we will stay in touch. There's no doubt about it. And okay. once again, I want to thank you for your efforts and all that you do for me uh, on a personal level. And also, you know, for coming on tonight's show. It was, it was truly enlightening. And thank you for being. We love having you as well. And, and um, just be well, you know. And, and we'll, 
things will really pick up this week things happen that we cannot speak about until of course the green cards are received um, and we have evidence that they were in they are in the right hands and then after that we'll you know the league kind of blew off of things this week so you know we'll we'll of course we'll keep in touch and and everything will be detailed as it happens Well, be well, my sister. You too. Be well. Love you. Be well. Okay. Bye-bye.